So uh, I just want to say thank you, Darina. Uh, thank you to all of the organizers, all of the uh, Retham No team. This has been a fantastic conference. Uh, I've learned so much from all these different approaches. Uh, and I'm just, I'm honored to have been asked and really grateful for a wonderful time and that you brought me from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, so thank you. Um, and so now something totally different. I'd like to take a look back at, I'd like to take a look back at the history of archeological fieldwork, its methods and its practices in the excavations at ancient Corinth Greece by the American School of Classical Studies. I take my lead from this conference's stated theme, investigating archeological practices and knowledge production in the past and reflecting on how changing methods and tools are impacting studies of past practices. Uh, moreover, I'll give some examples of how new approaches may allow us to engage more fruitfully with earlier work and to expand on their results uh, especially to reinterpret them using better contextual knowledge uh, and more refined data and spatial analysis. Um, I speak to you as a classical archaeologist specializing in the history of the built environment. Um, I'm someone who works on excavated art, especially mosaics, architecture and infrastructure, especially hydraulic, uh, using autopsy and archival work uh, and processing evidence through various lenses. Legacy data, even a century old or more, can be very useful, especially as, as we ask new questions of sites like Corinth that have been dug for a long time, since 1896 to be precise. Um, I want to alert you ahead of time to several points or themes that I hope you'll keep in mind. And then once I get into the body of the talk, I'm sort of gonna divide it into a number of chapters. But these are kind of, hopefully they'll sort of suffuse your thoughts as I speak. Uh, point number one, the early excavators deserve our respect. Uh, it's not productive to blame them for standards that were not up to ours. The quality of work and results can only be compared horizontally. Um, all the same, when working with old material, published or unpublished, we owe it to ourselves as we prepare to publish it to be clear on the strengths and weaknesses, the limitations. I need to be able to lay out the known knowns, things we know we know, the known unknowns, things we know we don't know, and to be aware that there remain unknown unknowns, things we don't even know we don't know. And that's to paraphrase uh, Donald Rumsfeld. Um, Point two, at Corinth, some archeologists were striving to understand stratigraphy already by 1902. And as I'll discuss, uh, stratigraphic evidence uh, uh, recorded in 1910 has been enough to thoroughly rewrite Corinthian urban history. Uh, and from the mid 20th century, especially from the 60s on, our record is really quite excellent and can support detailed reanalysis. And then there's three. The power of images. Visual imagery is one of our strongest tools for presenting and arguing conclusions. A convincing reconstruction is worth more than a thousand words. In the present, as in the past, we must be clear on degrees of certainty in any restoration, um, uh, in any restoration. 3D imaging, virtual reality, things like this can be constructive and highly influential. So it is imperative for us as scholars to recognize and articulate sources and biases, uh, and I think to work on new ways of foregrounding metadata in presentation and publication. So here you see the general area of the Corinth excavations as captured by Google Earth, uh, with the modern museum highlighted uh, there just left of center. Of standing monuments, the majority represent Corinth as it was uh, when it was the capital of the province of Achaia in the Roman imperial period, uh, such as the Forum here uh, east of the museum. But there are also holdovers from Corinth's autonomous period, uh, the great archaic temple uh, and the South Stoa to name two. 
And then my subject, it's in the north quarter of the excavation site, what I'm calling the Pyrene Valley. This is a north-south hollow cut by the streams that flowed north and downhill from the prolific spring known as Pyrene uh, back in its aboriginal state before humans had, done, uh, had changed its course. The proximity of this whole area, surrounded by a yellow box there, to the spring of Pyrene uh, down at the south end of it, ensured its continuous habitation and centrality at Corinth. Uh, in the early first millennium BCE, Pyrene's flow was first channeled with walls, uh, and after a spring house was built at the source, a drain was installed uh, near the original stream bed. Uh, it was eventually reinforced with massive walls and covered pieces, and I'll show you those uh, later on. The grand avenue of the Roman period here, the Lycaon Road, the straight road uh, to Lycaon, um, complete with colonnades and shops, runs parallel to the original stream bed and later the drain. Uh, excavations in Pyrene and then the valley between 1896 and 1973 have uncovered material and monuments dating from the Neolithic uh, through Greek independence, uh, often all in one building, uh, I should say. So many buildings have multiple phases. Uh, even Pyrene has something like 20 significant phases uh, just from the 6th century BCE to the 6th uh, century CE and many, many more up through the modern period. So after establishing a sort of baseline with the earliest American excavations in the late 19th century, I'm going to work around the valley in the first half of the 20th century. A towering figure here was Bert Hodge Hill, who worked at Corinth uh, from 1902 to 1941. Uh, Hill effectively transformed uh, the Corinth excavation from unsystematic digging to stratigraphic excavation in his own work and through teaching. For Corinth has always been a training excavation for American grad, school, grad students who work with the director and highly trained Greek excavators. At the same time, Hill's work within the Pyrene Valley was complicated and sometimes compromised by difficulties in managing what was a continuous flow of water from Pyrene. Uh, the water flows out of the bedrock, uh, and it, it can't be turned off. Uh, we don't have a tap to make it stop, uh, and so we'll come to that. But I'm going to take a few minutes uh, later on to discuss that, as it represents an important theme, the relationship of archaeologists, the community around them, and the nation that hosts them. Charles Williams, the excavator, excavation director at Corinth from 1966 to 1997, uh, was also ambitious and progressive, interested in optimizing record keeping, and active in fostering interdisciplinary work. And he still is, I should say. He's still alive and well. Um, and uh, it's wonderful when you can actually speak to the people who excavated the contexts that you're trying to uh, flesh out. In the Pyrene Valley, um, in the Pyrene Valley, Williams uh, led both broad area excavations and targeted text, test trenches. He published initial results, but he left the more detailed analysis for other scholars. Uh, some things have already appeared, and more is in the works. Uh, since 1997, I've worked at Corinth uh, seasonally, pretty much every summer. Um, first under Mr. Williams, then under directors Guy Sanders and Chris Pfaff who have both advanced the excavations um, a lot as well, but in ways that I really can't touch on today. Uh, so instead, I'm going to be focusing on what I know best, the Pyrene Spring House or Fountain, and the area just to its north. Uh, we've now initiated a collaborative pro project on the broader area, and I'll come back to this at the end. This is the uh, Pyrene Valley project. So into the chapters um, as we move through. Uh, the period of groping. In 1896, the American School with the Archaeological Institute of America won the right to excavate at ancient Corinth. Greek and German teams had done some minor work there, but the American efforts were of a new order, emulating the foreign establishments at Olympia, uh, Delphi, and such. Under Rufus B. Richardson, American School Director from 1893 to 1903, and the first head of the uh, Corinthian excavations, uh, the Americans opened 21 trenches, generally about three meters wide and of 
varying lengths and depths. Uh, the goal was stated, quote, to find some important point of the ancient city around which the future systematic excavations might be made. Found already in 1896, the theater was the first reference point. Uh, the theater was the first, uh, first reference point. Um, F.C. Babbitt, who published it, noted, though, that even though the theater itself should prove to be of no interest, at least it signaled the proximity of several monuments mentioned in the ancient traveler account by Pausanias, uh, written in the second century. He had mentioned the temples of Athena and Zeus and a gymnasium, and so they had some sense of if we have the theater, maybe these things are here or here. Uh, but after the find of the theater, still nothing more important was found until 1898, and that was the Fountain of Pyrene. Um, unlike the theater, Pyrene was inherently interesting. Um, after all, as the excavators pointed out, it was the most famous fountain from antiquity, known from Pindar, from Euripides, uh, and a slew of Roman authors. Uh, the esteemed German archaeologist Wilhelm Derpfeldt assured the Americans that Pyrene's discovery alone would be a brilliant success. Uh, moreover, with Pyrene on the map and Pausanias's travelogue in hand, the location of the Roman Forum immediately became clear. As Richardson said, the period of groping was over. Once the trenches produced targets, the archaeologists expanded them into open area excavations. Uh, here you see a 1 to 200 plan produced by Arthur Cooley in 1898 to show early progress. Already, Pyrene and the southwest part of the Pyrene Valley had been excavated uh, down to late antique and Roman levels. Digging back then was on a grand scale. Uh, daily details tend to be lost in the broad strokes of documentation. Uh, Richardson's notebooks are typical, and of course he was the boss, uh, so everyone followed him. He did not believe in taking notes in the field, uh, preferring to summarize progress uh, at every day's end, and so most of his students did the same. So days passed with no fines. Um, ground levels were in constant flux, and although relative elevations appear already on Cooley's plan, uh, they were surveyed after the season. Uh, so that means that they didn't benefit notebook keepers, and they are of less help for that reason uh, to us uh, today for understanding anything but standing structures, things that st still exist. But even that can be helpful. Uh, Cross-checks between notebooks, drawings, and photographs are often uh, illuminating, but from these earliest periods, uh, these sources altogether even fall short generally of providing satisfactual Context, satisfying contextual data. The location, identification, and dating of monuments were primary concerns of our archaeologists in these days, but excavation notebooks reflect also the controlling interests of art history and the classics. Notes focus on objects, particularly inscriptions, ancient art, and coins. Uh, such treasures were carefully sketched or traced with loving uh, attention, but relatively little hard contextual evidence was recorded. Uh, instead, we may read about the proximity to some landmark, a tree, a building, or a property line, only sometimes recognizable uh, today, uh, and sometimes a measure of depth, which may or may not be uh, recoverable. Um, but between 1903 and 06, Sculpture, inscription, and pottery registers or indices were established. Uh, these are the ancestors of today's Microsoft Access database that contains everything now that has ever been inventoried in the Corinth excavations. Uh, diagnostic pottery samples were saved and kept, lotted from 1910. Um, and so the preservation of many artifacts and descriptions of pottery uh, that had to be discarded to make room for more in some cases, they actually work to make a portion of the, um, this early data now still accessible and useful today. 
But especially in the early days of the Corinth excavations, dating relied largely on historical preconceptions. The temptation to connect Corinth's monuments and their phases to historical figures and other luminaries was great, especially when chronological primacy was concerned. Richardson assigned our archaic temple in the nearby fountain of Glauke to the age of Periander, Corinth's most famous tyrant. Uh, and when a marble statue base shown here turned up in Pyrene in 1899, inscribed with the name Regilla as an image of wisdom by the streams of the source, uh, Richardson immediately identified the subject as the wife of Herodes Atticus. If you, don't know, if you don't know Herodes, he's like the Donald Trump of second century CE Greece. Really, like, no class here. Um, um, anyway, um, so, he, so one of the most famous magnets of the 20, second century CE and somebody who built great projects elsewhere. Uh, Richardson then took a leap and credited Herodes with the most impressive phase of Pyrene, the triconch court uh, that still stands. Uh, this is a huge, a large courtyard uh, with three apses that all face onto the facade that shelters the spring um, and the aquifer itself. So here you're seeing the facade um, and you can see to either side the east and west apse and you see in plan the three apses uh, facing onto the facade. Um, it seemed to make sense to Richardson that uh, what was clearly once a marble magnificence should belong to that apogee of Roman Empire. And it was actually a reasonable hypothesis for someone who was seeing the monument for the first time in 500 years. This approach now, linking names and dates to buildings, uh, matching monuments to historical people, um, the fact is quite a few of Richardson's dates and associations have stuck, can mostly be blamed on deference or uncritical acceptance. We can't question the greats. On the other hand, Richardson himself considered himself a scientist, and so we should be able to enter into dialogue. Um, in any case, here, what seemed almost a certainty to Richardson, unlimited evidence effectively became a certainty. Um, until I found a way to disprove it, and I'll come back to that. Now, Bert Hodge Hill worked at Corinth for over 30 years as a student and fellow, director and director emeritus. Uh, Hill was a stickler for details, insisting on clear narration of excavation work uh, with elevation and sectional drawings, detailed descriptions of finds. He hired, brought on board architects, geologists, chemists, microbiologists, hygienic engineers, and others to help him understand finds and environmental conditions. Uh, from him, we have at least 33 field notebooks, uh, plus numerous letters and scraps of paper with his approaches to stratigraphic analysis and building um, autopsy. So even if his records are not fully up to current standards, they often contain much in the way of useful data. Uh, Hill first dug in Corinth in 1902. Already that year's dig notebook marks the first dramatic shift in the approach to excavation, his approach to excavation and record keeping. The pace of work still was pretty typical of these early days. Big teams of Greek workmen, up to 500 railroad carts of earth moved each day. Uh, might be, uh, was, was not unusual. But Hill spared no archeological detail and he started taking notes while excavating. Um, decided that before Richardson got down to the site. Um, Throughout the season, Hill carefully identified and mapped ancient structures and topographical features, while another student, S.E. Bassett, recorded movable finds. Hill measured progress in meters, paces, and carloads, and showed the extent of each day's work in a series of sketch plans. He recorded elevations, not only of artifacts and buildings, but of the earthen fills surrounding them. Um, and he introduced sectional diagrams to elucidate relationships among sediment layers and other features. So here on the right, um, you see some of the first stratigraphic sections uh, in one of the Corinth notebooks. This is 1902. At this point, most of them are mere sketches. A few are measured drawings. Uh, thereafter, sectional stratigraphic drawings would become commonplaces in Hill's notebooks, um, as they would in those of his students later. 
So thus we see an awareness of stratigraphy dawning at Corinth. Uh, it's difficult to measure the extent to which such awareness, uh, yet I think incomplete application, improved interpretations and publications, at least at first. Um, it appears that little of the stratigraphic e evidence was really fully exploited. History and historical assumptions still weighed heaviest uh, in interpretations for decades more. Uh, nonetheless, the new contextual sec sensitivity, I believe, sharpened eyes, observations, and written records and gave us some things to chew on. Now, the Pyrene Court had been hastily excavated in 1898 and 99. And unfortunately, subsequent work in and around it was often compromised by continued pressures and problems with plumbing. Uh, where Hill and his students were able, however, they ag excavated with care and careful documentation. Their records articulate the evidence with, um, with enough detail um, to remain understandable and often to support reconsideration and reinterpretation even a century later. So a case in point is the excavation of a room just east of Pyrene's East Apse by Hill, uh, by Hill and his student Ashton Sanborn in 1910. It's the room surrounded by blue uh, here just outside, uh, outside the Eastern Apse of the Great Pyrene Court. Uh, this, excavation uh, this excavation yielded the crucial evidence that allowed me to redate Pyrene's monumental triconch court from the 2nd to the 4th century CE. Uh, to newcomers in classical archaeology, that might seem like not a very big difference, uh, but uh, it's the difference between Corinth's Roman imperial heyday um, and a period that was long seen as like a tragic twilight as Corinth slipped below into the Dark Ages. Uh, so it was quite a thing to re reassign this great monument uh, and essentially to give Corinth back its history. A number of other scholars were working in that late antique period around the same time. Um, here's, here you see, there. Uh, here you see another view of the room. I wanna draw your attention to the material there in the apse wall, especially uh, the part that I've circled in red. Um, now Sanborn's workload was typical of, stu of a student supervisor in his time. His records are full of sketches of coins and statuary inscriptions and other stuff. Um, his many plans, elevations, and sections though are exemplary. Um, unfortunately, they're all in pencil so they aren't uh, that photogenic. Um, Sanborn's notebook here, supplemented by Hills, lets us recreate the excavation in this room east of Pyrene. The upper part of the room had been cleared in 1899, but the underlying material remained untouched. Uh, digging down outside Pyrene's East Steps wall, workers removed broken limestone blocks, then large chunks of white marble architectural elements and part of a life-size marble statue, Inscribed marble fragments uh, were also present. One was datable to the mid first century CE, others to the late second. Um, the stratum containing the marble fragments uh, continued and extended across the room. So it's in here, this area here. Um, below the large marble fragments, revetment pieces became jumbled with broken tiles, giving way to a thin layer of disintegrated lime plaster and pebbles and then five to 10 centimeters of carbonized material. This ash layer testifies to a fire in the chamber. A late second century terminus postquem uh, for the event comes from a coin in the burn layer in the middle of the room. It was minted under the emperor Commodus who ruled from 180 to 193 uh, CE. Below that were layers identified as earlier Roman floors and earlier strata. Now what was great was because they were digging down from a room and measuring downwards from walls that still stand, I was able to find their benchmarks and actually get very accurate measurements myself. Um, so now this tracing from a photograph of the apse wall approximately calibrated with the 1910 stratigraphic record indicates that while the, there are differences between the material 
in the wall and in sandboard section, uh, especially down here where uh, built structures go way down to ground. Um, while there are differences between the material in the wall and Sanborn section, several common strata can be identified. Uh, below the horizontally laid courses of the built wall, uh, you may you see a large, uh, a large limestone block out here. Um, it hangs rather precariously. Its elevation agrees with the other limestone chunks that Sanborn recorded as he removed them from the room. Uh, mortar attaches it to the blocks above, but it rests on kind of a, a thick, uh, soft dirt fill. Uh, below that fill, uh, mixed into that fill, come large marble elements, then broken tiles and some smaller marble fragments in soil. The soil around the target tiles is soft brownish gray with carbonized wood throughout. And towards the bottom of the lens, uh, the soil becomes still darker with a lot more charcoal. Uh, it was in that lens that uh, traces of rusted iron, including ancient nails and things, um, were visible when I explored this room uh, right at the elevation reported for the coin of Commodus. So thus, levels preserved in the wall of uh, Pyrene's East Apse correspond to those found throughout the room uh, next door. They are, in effect, in, they are in effect, um, oh, sorry, I missed a, uh, they are in effect an extension of excavated fills. The upper layers of large debris may have seemed solid enough to serve in situ as foundation material. Um, and so it seems that the apse walls, thick mortar and rubble core was simply poured onto uh, this hard fill. Uh, and this explains why only a portion of the wall incorporates the fill that matches up with everything across the room while others go down to the bottom. Uh, so time is tight and I can't get into the earlier history, uh, but basically uh, to lay out sort of the end and the things that followed. The room was in use when a fire severe enough to blacken and scar the surrounding walls uh, swept, uh, swept through. Uh, the burn layer with uh, the coin dates, uh, with the coin dates the evidence to the last decades of the second century CE or later. The overlaying layers probably represent a mixture of fire damage and cleanup. Uh, and then the room was abandoned. The northern doorway was blocked by the construction of a large apse in the neighboring space to the north. That's here, this is called the Pervolus of Apollo. Um, and it's, planned in, um, it's prudent to date this to the end of the second century CE or the early third. Uh, Pyrene was at this time enclosed by the rectangular court that you see here. Its plan didn't yet change. Uh, so the western flank of the Pervolus apse, you can see abuts the straight eastern wall. Now only later, half of that big apse was removed to allow for the construction uh, of the triconch court of Pyrene. If the Pribilis apse existed as planned for a while, as we would imagine, before its partial dismantlement, then for Pyrene's triconch court, we need to be looking for a mid to late third century date at the very earliest, uh, long after Herodes Atticus was gone. Uh, once the popular connection to Herodes was disproved, I could bring other methods to bear uh, because I had no better contextual data. Um, and so I brought in new evidence to suggest a more comfortable fit for the monument. Um, I turned to art historical method, uh, formal analysis, and comparanda. Um, and this pointed to mid to late fourth century uh, and fifth century structures such as these, uh, these monumental generally dining and reception halls of a triconch, a three apsed uh, form. Um, and this also happens to coincide with this blast of references by late antique orators, Julian, Themistius, Hamarius, um, you name them. So this conclusion, this redating is now widely accepted. Um, and so I use this to show that even though the earlier excavators uh, didn't dig as we would have it, and made some incorrect conclusions, their archived records contained evidence that provided the found foundation for reanalysis and I think a convincing revision. 
Now zooming out a bit uh, for the bigger picture of the Pyrene Valley, excavations up to 29, 1929, uh, gradually uncovered the rest of the so-called Parabolus of Apollo, uh, north of Pyrene. This was a peristyle court of the Roman imperial period. Um, uh, and also uh, part of a Roman bath outside both of these pictures to the north. Uh, earlier monuments underlying these include a 5th century BCE temple and altar that you see here stripped to its foundations. Uh, to the east, the, earlier, the early excavators also uncovered a bronze foundry from the earliest days of the Roman colony. But let's turn the page, uh, chapter 4. Work in the Pyrene Valley, as I've mentioned, uh, was always complicated by the fact that Pyrene remained the most important source of water for the village of ancient Corinth, uh, with the major village fountains uh, in, the, in town uh, downstream from the excavations. Thus, as soon as our guys got into the, the mud, the ladies, the washerwomen down the stream uh, would see it coming out on the other end. Um, Long before the American work began, though, travelers to Corinth reported that the residents were remarkably unwell, despite what should have been a healthy, high-altitude setting overlooking the Gulf. Uh, we now know that Pyrene was the problem. It was a disease pool. Uh, one American school director, T.W. Hermans, uh, died of typhoid that he caught in Pyrene in 1905. Uh, Bert Hodge Hill contracted it there in 1911. Uh, but he survived. Um, malaria was endemic. Hill had it, most students had it, and the villagers suffered terribly from it. All excavations in the area through the 1930s ended up being kind of essentially rescue operations, uh, reactive generally more than proactive, uh, though Bert Hodge Hill gradually moved to predictive studies and action. He would devote most, much of his midlife's work to the fountain and the spring, trying to make them meet the needs of the village. Oops. Uh, repeated flooding between 1906 and 1910 forced the investigation and clearing of Pyrene's reservoirs and drains. Uh, so here on the left, you've been looking at mud men, uh, just returned from cleaning the, uh, the reservoirs underground. And uh, Carl Blagan and Emerson Swift on the right, after surveying a, middle, a medieval channel up to their necks in water with only a little bit of room overhead. Uh, Hill and his associates experimented with methods for cleaning out the saturated mud in the spring house. At least one apparatus anticipated tools that have since become common in underwater archaeology. It was a vacuum cleaner using hoses and a pump designed to suck sediment from the waterlogged areas. Um, unfortunately, the pump turned out to be too weak to pull up the mud as well as the water, uh, so the excavators reverted to buckets and boxes and pulleys, tackle, hauling big box loads out of Pyrene of mud, out of Pyrene with a pulley system. Other excavation methods were, also, were picked up along the way. Some learned from the locals. Uh, they actually, they actually, the locals, uh, the Corinthians actually inaugurated the age of remote sensing right around the same time. Uh, William Dinsmore, one of our chief architects, had surveyed the Pyrene drain, shown here on the right, um, and was digging holes to confirm, to try to find the position of a manhole in the village um, uh, that was along the course of it. Um, and he was, so he was digging aimlessly and failing when one of the villagers brought out a set of gimlets, these two to three meter long screws, uh, said Dinsmore, and I quote, my unskillful struggles were viewed with amusement by the onlookers until the owner, unable to restrain his impatience, poured water down the length of the rod and rapidly twisted it into the earth until it struck what proved to be the cover of the manhole. And then he effaced himself into the crowd. Uh, this was because, as the excavators learned, gimlets were used by, um, by local Corinthian residents to prospect for tombs uh, in the plain below. So it goes. Through the 19-teens, severe weather caused new catastrophic flooding and swarms of malarial mosquitoes, not only in Pyrene, but throughout the valley and Corinth. 
the cleanup of the area, and measures to protect, prevent a recurrence were the priority of American Red Cross efforts in 1919, in which the archaeologists collaborated with relief workers. A Red Cross work order followed Hill's recommendations for the construction of permanent dams and dikes, the clearing of drains to carry water uh, past the spring house and beyond the edges of the dig and the village, uh, and the replacement of ancient med and medieval ch channels with modern pipes. Funding and work were shared by the Red Cross, the Department of Antiquities, then part of the Ministry of Education, uh, the American School, and the village. Uh, the project was seen as a model of inexpensive village level sanitation and all hoped that, quote, whatever was done at Old Corinth would soon become widely known and, um, and the influence of its example would be generally followed elsewhere in Greece, end quote. Unfortunately, Pyrene remained chronically ill. The slide here shows what the humans were up against. Behind the facade, Pyrene has a full kilometer of water-producing tunnels cut through porous bedrock. Uh, this is all here in blue. In antiquity, this watershed lay under a sacred grove and then the paved forum of the Roman city. Now villagers and their animals lived across the area. Uh, after his retirement, Berthage Hill came back in 1932 and he approached Pyrene with, a new, purpo with new purpose. He had all the village springs analyzed and this confirmed his suspicions that fecal contamination in Pyrene was behind a new and particularly horrible epidemic of typhoid that year. Uh, he consulted the Athens Health Center, which was a partnership of the Rockefeller Foundation and the Greek government. Uh, together, they tested antiseptic agents and devised a plan to make Pyrene's water safe for once and for all. Um, as I imagined, wrote Hill, Nothing short of clearing to the sources and then either sealing manholes and clearing the whole thing will protect the water. Uh, and so they did that. They cleaned these channels back to their ends. The labor was hard, uh, but in addition to finally sterilizing Pyrene, um, if then only temporarily, the project produced um, also important archaeological results. By summertime, the tunnels had been cleared to their very ends. 18 manhole shafts were located and emptied from top to bottom um, as well. Final preparations for disinfection followed Athens School of Hygiene specifications. Uh, most manholes uh, were closed with a reinforced concrete plug inserted about eight meters down at the interface between the corruptible soil um, and the less corruptible uh, bedrock. Uh, clean sand was poured into the shaft above. Hill's notebook has pages and pages of plans for rebar reinforced custom covers. In May 1933, Hill and Christos Flores, a hygienic engineer from the School of Hygiene, began chemical treatment. They closed down the fountain, uh, closed all outlets, they flooded the system, filled the system, um, and then introduced a high concentration chlorine solution um, and then they did it the next day, uh, letting that solution stand for two days before flushing it out. Uh, and then this process was repeated over months. All of this work was made possible by philanthropic gifts, uh, a pump bought by the state, other equipment and a foreman provided by the American school, and labor by the village uh, paid in drachmas and in quinine. In nearly four decades of work at Pyrene, Berthage Hill had unparalleled opportunities to learn how the ancient system of Pyrene worked. His efforts, as supported by the American school, NGOs, and national and local funds, also represent an important chapter of modern public health and hygiene issues in a rural community. The last efforts to sanitize the system seem to have cured it for about 20 years. Uh, in our age of rampant development, over-exploitation of the groundwater and the infiltration of pesticides and fertilizers, uh, as well as the, um, have made the ills of the aquifer now certainly uncurable. Next chapter, the power of images, uh, beholder beware. As Berthage Hill prepared his Corinth volume on Pyrene for publication, he turned to architect Gorham Phillips Stevens to produce perspectival reconstructions. 
Stevens's work drawings are fascinating studies of reconstruction technique. On multiple leaves of tracing paper, sight lines were derived from plans and elevation. Features were drawn, critiqued, and redrawn. Selections of statuary were based on excavated examples, stock figures, and literary testimonia. In the resulting reconstruction, established features were rendered accurately, and hypothetical features and unknowns were also rendered as if accurately. Stephen's monumental perspective of uh, Pyrene in the period of Herodes Atticus combines well-attested structures, reconstructed features based on com comparative data, and pure conjecture. Um, Stevens carefully explained his use of evidence in the publication that first accompanied the drawing, but the drawing itself, without that text, came to be the most well-known document of Pyrene, reproduced on postcards and in textbooks, and widely embraced with little notice of Stevens's parameters and explanations. Uh, the thing is that Stevens' image is so compelling that even divorced from its metadata, it lived on. Um, and though now thoroughly debunked, it still crops up. So for instance, uh, Cyarch, which came and did an uh, entire uh, digitization of, Corinth, of, of Pyrene and posted it us, for us all to use, they then recently posted a video on Facebook of work springing from their photogrammetric data um, at Pyrene. It's wonderful. Uh, in real time, it would spin around and you can see the whole Gorham Stevens reconstruction. Uh, but the problem is that the creators uncritically merged a very outdated res restoration with that great Cyarch data. Um, so fine imaging doesn't excuse a lack of research, um, but I know that I'm preaching to the choir here. Back to the future, uh, a mere lifetime. Charles Williams became field director of the Corinth excavations in 1966, and his first seasons took him back into the Pyrene Valley. He followed in the footsteps of Henry Robinson, no relation to me. Uh, compared to their predecessors, they carried out excavations on a much smaller scale, focusing on systematizing workflow, improving record keeping, and especially paying new attention to late antiquity and beyond. A major tenet since William's time is that the archeological remains of all ancient and historical periods are valued and need to be considered when field work is planned and undertaken. William's work in the Pyrene Valley was a combination of revi revisiting previously excavated areas and opening new trenches, often with a research question in mind. For instance, prehistorian Bill Phelps got to dig several small trenches down to bedrock, revealing Neolithic and early Helladic material in colluvial deposits um, right along the aboriginal Pyrene stream bed. Um, a late 5th century BC structure was found built into bedrock just east of the stream bed in the northern part of the Peribolus of Apollo. It consisted of two rooms. One looks like a reservoir or cistern and the other a washroom. Williams suggested that it and some platforms to each side were dye works, a hypothesis that we actually don't feel as comfortable with uh, today. Uh, but Williams' excavations expanded from this area eventually to the north to include the Roman bath uh, that was partially excavated in 1929, and then he moved west across the street into a late antique hemispikes, hemicycle um, on the other side of the Lycaon Road. Since 2018, the Corinth excavations have been using the IDIG application developed by Bruce Hartzler in the American School's Athenian Agora excavations, uh, where it's been used since about 2012. In IDIG, an excavator uses an iPad to record a multi-dimensional matrix of what's found and where. Dirt removed, the qualities and context of strata, the objects and features and their relationships to architecture and fill, etc. Um, after each day in the field, the excavator links sketches, forms, uh, total station data, and museum accession, accession numbers in. Uh, IDIG data is easily imported into FileMaker, Access, GIS, and other packages. Um, and all of the data is also tried into drone surveys, photogrammetric models, and GIS corrected orthomosaics and drawings. 
In 2015, the excavator welcomed that team from SciArc, a nonprofit working in the creation of free online open access library uh, with, of 3D data on cultural heritage sites worldwide. Uh, SciArc photographed and laser scanned Pyrene and our archaic temple, um, and the data behind them are all available on their website along with other wonders of the world. In the meantime, Corinth's full-time personnel have worked hard to build and maintain good relationships with Greek archaeological and heritage professionals. Increasingly, efforts are being made to let students of archaeology and interested locals volunteer. Uh, and Associate Director Yulia Zanu and a museum fellow, currently uh, Eleni Gizas, are deeply involved in curriculum design uh, for Greek and American schools, both with students coming into Corinth and Skyping across to um, America. Uh, they're also active on social ma media and in the popular press, like this LIFO article that just came out this week. And finally, into the stretch. In the Pyrene Valley, water and water management have been strong forces of change from the beginning of human settlement in the area. So a return to this area is timely after the appearance um, of my book on the, this, on the Fountain of Pyrene, Histories of Pyrene, as well as several key studies by Mark Landon. About four years ago, I conceived of a new study, the Pyrene Valley Project, uh, with Yulia Zanu. Uh, we were standing right there by the so-called dye works uh, and got talking. Together, we bring a detailed knowledge of the area, its excavation history, and the history of architecture and hydraulic engineering at Corinth. That's more me and prehistoric Corinth, pottery, and museum studies, uh, that's her. We recruited James Herbst, Corinth architect, drone pilot, and GIS specialist. Eric Paler joined us as a co-PI in 2018, uh, and he brings critical expertise in spatial analysis and data architecture, um, as you've seen, and he was just coming off a project at nearby Isthmia. Our project builds upon dig other digital initiatives at Corinth, uh, and the American School. Um, and we've really just had our first full summer season. Uh, we're starting by focusing on the area just north of Pyrene, that so-called Peribolus of Apollo. Uh, from there, we'll move north then perhaps west. Uh, we're rectifying old stone for stone plans with drone photography and photogrammetry. Some late walls still stand several meters high and it's very difficult to think them away in order to better envision relationships and phases. Uh, 3D models will let us better far parse the different phases and virtually to expose underlying remains. They will also serve as state records, potentially guiding future conservation projects. Um, I'm also very interested in IIIF for sharing and annotating images. Uh, and finally, we hope eventually to draw on the expertise of Colin Wallace, uh, who is already doing retrospective photogrammetry using old negatives to restore structures removed by early excavations. Um, and so towards that end, we already made uh, hundreds of high resolution scans of glass and film negatives la ne last year. Uh, architectural restorations by James Herbst will serve both to test hypotheses and present conclusions. Applying new methods to old records is itself a challenge. For instance, we originally planned to use iDig but quickly realized that it wasn't flexible enough to adapt to the notebooks of the 60s, never mind the early 20th century. But at least in the 60s, thanks to Charles Williams, record keeping was systematic, with students prompted by a series of blue notebook stamps to enter certain kinds of information for every stratum or material culture unit. Eric designed a new database with Chris Motts on FileMaker Pro. Uh, one tailored specifically to the 1960 records. Um, and they're working with James Herbst to ensure that it is completely compatible with the main Corinth database um, in access, um, as well as the American School's visual platform, ASCSA.net. Um, we, we hope that by working through the old notebooks, uh, basically virtually re-excavating the Pyrene Valley, uh, we'll be able to pull and analyze a great deal of useless data. Uh, and then we will see about working backwards uh, to a century or more. Um, since much of Corinth's finds are preserved on site, 
we will be able to handle and read them. Uh, Yulia and I actually have already begun going through some of the 1966 lots. Charles Williams has enumerated the advantages um, of the big, big urban archaeological sites with long excavation histories such as Corinth particularly their role as repositories for large collections of artifacts that can serve as comparanda and controls for material from other excavations and surveys. At the same time, our growing knowledge, new research methods, and fresh questions may offer significant insights into the material uncovered in our own city in a century's excavations. The Pyrene Valley will be a valuable laboratory of legacy archaeology and digital applications, a place to push new non-destructive methods. Uh, while the whole area has technically been published, uh, it has really never received the attention it deserves, and we aim to fix that. Uh, with 5,000 years of material culture, all within a few hectares, um, it is key to understanding the urban history of Corinth. Thank you for bearing with me. Uh, few minutes to cocktail hour. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And we have, uh, we have just five minutes, ten minutes for uh, questions and a discussion. Yes, please. Hi, it, it, yeah, sorry, Gavin uh, from the UK. Um, just a quick question. Uh, um, why did Sioc do the photogrammetry? Uh, because you, you said they did them once before and then they did it again afterwards? Was that right? I, sorry, I can't. Uh, so you mentioned that Sioc was doing photogrammetry. Uh, they were doing it twice, once early on and then once later on? They, all, they came in one, um, one batch. They've created, I think it's linked with Google, they've created this website where you can go in and like batch download vast amounts of data and make 3D models of buildings themselves. So they came once and, um, and took all of the data. They did a LIDAR of the archaic temple and as well as I think photogrammetry mm -hmm. and uh, Pyrene, they did a photo survey. Uh, but I just, I brought it up earlier because it's what somebody did with their, uh, their evidence, which was great. It was really creative, but, um, but they just, they went back to things that were published, written in the 30s, instead of going and getting a brand new book off the shelf uh, with better data. And I think, you know, this is something that I, as the art historian and Luddite on my teams, I'm, I'm very conscious of. I'm trying to learn photogrammetry and some of these digital techniques so that I can meet my colleagues halfway, but I think it's also really important um, to, for you know, the people getting into the 3D imaging and whatever, to get into the library, find the newest stuff, uh, and talk to us, uh, the, the art historians and archaeologists. People are thirsty. I know it's late and I talked a long time, 50 minutes. Uh, Eric Paler, uh, I talk a lot. Betsy, I'm gonna be somewhat indulgent, but I think in, in a way that helps, it might be useful to summarize some of the things we've said today, which is just that in working on the database with Betsy and, and going through these old notebooks and trying to design, uh, as many of you have, uh, a, an information structure that is faithful to both the archeology span and to the process by which it was, it was generated, while at the same time trying to reflect best practices of the current world is a real challenge. And one of the things that, in particular, um, you know, what I saw from um, uh, Marcos, your, your presentation today, you had the stratigraphic unit in the center of your database, and rightly so, because I think that's the way that we conceive of these, these issues. But what's clearly been the case is that that process of the stratigraphic unit being central has been a slow slide to the center. And capturing this kind of information digitally means that we either have to have a kind of 
slow slide across our database, which is really hard to do in the kind of a, in a, in an evolutionary back end, um, or we have to find ways to be uh, very flexible in our descriptions because at for much of the history of classical archaeology, at least, the artifact was at the center of these of these de database designs, and only slowly has the the, the strat stratigraphic information become the center. Uh, and that's something that is only kind of dawning on me right now as I as I come to to realize these things, and I I offer it as a a thing that I think might be of value and and maybe a, a source of conversation later. But drinks. Yeah, it, it was fascinating uh, working side by side in the library, um, just going through. We, we each had a notebook. Uh, he had one from 66, I had one from 67. And we just went through, and f I think for the first half of our time together, uh, we were just revising the database pretty much twice a day trying to move things around and get things. And then we got to a point where it was fairly stable and sustainable. Uh, but then we had discussions over all of these the minutiae. Um, but this is so crucial for getting it right um, and making something that's going to be completely uh, missable with the, uh, with the current data. And again, we're really lucky to be doing this while Charles Williams uh, is alive and well and coming and going because we were able to ask questions and, uh, and find out about data curation uh, facts of 1966-67 uh, and get a better sense of what, when we look at a lot, it's going to contain. Uh, so since everybody else I've worked on Corinth died at least 10 years before I was born, that's really great. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Eric. Yes. Since you're talking about changes in archaeological practice, one that I could mention with what I'm trying to do for you with the uh, retrospective phot of photogrammetry is if you were to dig Pyrene uh, right now, you would take the, this, probably the same photo from the same angle as they did back in you know, 1902 or whenever, except in 1902 they would have 120 workers stand in front of it, sit on top of the rocks and everything, and that drives me crazy because I've got to mask them all. <laughs> the documentation in the uh, 50s and 60s really changed and, and suddenly there was much more cohesive and, and of course photography was a lot easier. We weren't using glass plates. Yeah. Yeah, we, we scanned a number of glass, uh, 8 by 10 glass plates at 3,200 DPI um, with the idea that when, Corin when Colin finishes his dissertation or something, he's going to start running them day and night uh, and see. My, my hope is to, I think the one that I really want to see is a 3D model of the early Roman colonial um, uh, foundry uh, because it's just such a fascinating object but it's been refilled and probably has deteriorated. Uh, so definitely have some targets. And many of these have enough different angles of photographs taken that with Colin working with the high resolution images uh, and a calibrated, uh, a calibrated scanner bed, uh, I'm hopeful that he'll be able to pull some things together. So not only South American archeologists like to drink at the end of the day. <laughs> but no. but I think people need some refreshment. They're looking tired. I have a very small uh, and rather irrelevant uh, remark. Uh, as a prehistorian, of course I don't know uh, the history of research in classical archaeology in Greece and in Corinth, uh, but would a male hunted uh, um, a, a, a male crowded world, archaeological world, a universe of men. You, you must be among the first generations of women at Corinth, I don't. Uh, uh, when, when do the first women archaeologists appear? I have appear? one. There's one in, um, in hold that on, research. let me see if I can bring you to her. I think 
It's a little bit, it's men, 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 men. Um, men, men. But no, this one, um, it was mostly men, but I've actually been um, doing some work and I was really sort of surprised and shocked to see how many uh, women were passing through the American school. Not always, um, not always actually excavating, but so here, yes, you have her, and I, I'm not sure who that is. It may be Hedy, uh, Hedy Goldman, uh, who went on and was digging up in Boeotia by 1916. But yeah, it was because I found this image of this woman standing in the trenches, um, in the trench. I went looking, and I was actually shocked. I made a tick next to every woman who attended the American school before 1920. Most of them were classicists. I think it was, this was man work. Um, and it may have also had to do with how they were living. Again, people were, uh, T.W. Hermans was somebody who regularly biked back and forth from Corinth to Athens. It's now an hour's train ride. Um, and he still got knocked off within a couple weeks by typhoid. Uh, so it wasn't great being there. Um, one, this, the other person this could be is Lucy Cosmopolis, who from uh, malaria lost her hearing. Uh, so as an older woman, she apparently walked around with a big box with a cone coming out of it uh, to be able to hear. Um, so I think it was a hard life. And uh, so maybe the women it stayed up. It, it was perhaps a bias also, a bias. It was, uh, I think so. But in Crete, for example, Harriet Boyd Halls was here by 900. And she discussed with Arthur Evans and with all these uh, uh, sacred monsters, let's say, of archaeology. She was a, a, a quite emancipated woman archaeologist. Yeah, but and not there. I mean, in, yeah. in prehistory, in my known archaeology, there have been women. Well, like Ida Thallon Hill was her contemporary. Um, and there yeah. is a difference with classical archaeology. Yeah, but Ida Thallon Hill, she, she, would, she went through the school around 1902, but then she dug outside Athens. So I think maybe they chose more convenient places. You know, and this was probably a boys club. I mean, I have to, it was, I mean, yeah. I'm sure, <laughs> yeah. Well, especially they're running around in their bathing suits, uh, you know, jumping in and out of. Pyrene was also the dark room. It was also the bath. Um, and so, you know, having a co-ed group there uh, mm -hmm. in the early days. Actually, right up until, um, like, so Kathleen Slain, Nancy Bukidis, uh, older colleagues of mine just passed retirement age now. When they excavated at Corinth, women had to wear skirts. Um, and so, so it wasn't much different uh, from that. All right, so thank, thank you, you very much. And